Uh, my name is Ed Whiting, I'm the Director of Policy and Chief of Staff at the Wellcome Trust. We're a medical research charity, we're, we're one of the larger ones um, in the world. We're aiming to spend around £5 billion over the next five years on a range of, sort of global health issues. Um, the top of our agenda is what we call drug-resistant infection, superbugs, AMR, it's got lots of different names. Uh, but it's a really big global challenge that, that we've been involved in in supporting the Jim O'Neill Review, which I also was involved in, as Jim said, from inside government. Uh, and it's something where we're looking to expand our program too. So it's, it's an enormous privilege to be here and really grateful for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the threat and about resistance, uh, talk about the causes and also what we can do about it. And I'll summarise some of Jim's recommendations as well, so you have those. I'll talk a little bit about what has been going on in the UK in terms of what the government's done and, and, and where we're headed. Um, a few caveats. Uh, so about a couple of hours ago, I did my first radio interview uh, in this job, which was enormously enjoy enjoyable. So with Adrian Charles on Five Live, one of the first things he said was, I've looked you up on Wikipedia, you've got no science qualifications, what on earth are you doing here? Um, and I'll, I'll be the second person here to say that I don't have science qualifications, I've come from government, I've worked a fair amount in AMR, so I, I'm relatively familiar with the issues. I'll talk you through the science as I, as I understand it, um, but to be clear about my role, one of the things that we don't do that well in global health is turn that science and turn that evidence that we come up with with research into practical policy recommendations and into things that actually change the world and change people's behaviour. So my job is to help do that. I'm not here to be um, a, a deep-brained nerd, although I'd love to be one. Um, I'm here to help with that sort of more practical side. So when we want questions, I'll be very honest about what I do and, do and don't know, uh, and you can, you can tell me where I get it wrong as well. But to start looking through what is antibiotic resistance, uh, a couple of very simple things. This is about superbugs, not superhumans. It's about building up um, about bugs that build up resistance to antibiotics. Uh, to try and sort of explain how it's, others from the audience will be able to do this much better than I, but I'll have a quick go to explain how resistance spreads and grows. Um, if you think of antibiotics target specific characteristics of bacteria, uh, there are, there'll, there'll be some that they get and some that they don't get. That leaves a bunch of bacteria not affected by a particular antibiotic, and those bacteria are left to multiply, um, and that disrupts the balance in, in the, often in the gut, uh, in the body, and it means that you can increase the population of resistant bacteria, which we call superbugs. So it's a little bit like natural selection, um, and, and it's basically how what is happening at the minute, and I'll show you a few sort of specific examples about how resistance is growing. Um, bacteria reproduce about every 90 minutes, uh, give or take. Um, which means that this is something that can happen relatively quickly. Uh, and um, also worth saying this difference between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Uh, you'll hear this a little bit when you hear people talking about this issue. Gram-negative is stuff that we really worry about, because it's not about whether it's a particular infection is more sort of virulent or not. Gram-negative are the ones that are harder to break down, are harder to beat. Um, and they're also the ones for which we do not have uh, as many antibiotics, and we don't have enough antibiotics to take them on. So it's worth just thinking, you know, the gram-positive ones are simpler in structure, the gram-negative ones are more complex in structure and have more sort of layers that you have to get through in order to defeat them. Um, and that is in the simplest, most non-scientific language I can manage, so I hope I'm on the right track. Uh, what does this mean? Well, firstly, more antibiotics are now only effective through intravenous uh, delivery as opposed to tablets, so the way you receive antibiotics in the future may change. Um, there's a greater reliance on mass line antibiotics, so the small number and the small classes of drugs that really are broad spectrum and take on a range of infections. This is high risk because when bacteria become resistant to the last line antibiotics, we just run out of ways to treat people. So this is why the last line stuff really matters, and I'll talk through a couple of examples of how that's happening in a minute. Um, so the, a really important part here as well is that we rely on antibiotics for infection control. So when you, when you have a hip replacement, when you have a C-section, when you have chemotherapy, it's not that the antibiotics are the way that those things are delivered, it's that after you've had it, you use antibiotics to, to manage that risk that you'll catch other infections. As anti antibiotics become, as, as bugs become more resistant, there's a higher risk that, that really simple, really vital uh, procedures like this become unsafe. And that is why we talk about medicine going back to the dark ages, uh, which is the most sort of the grimmest way you can talk about antibiotic resistance. Uh, this just gives an illustration of, of why it's more expensive uh, to treat AMR resistant, so drug resistant bugs. So it's, this is about uh, per hospital treatment per infection. So in average in the US, it costs about $35,000 to treat a MRSA, or a resistant infection, versus around $16,000, I'm very sorry about the colors, 
uh, $16,000 um, to, to, to treat a, a strain that isn't drug, drug resistant, it's drug sensitive. And you can see a higher mortality rate. Um, so, you know, hopefully convincing you that drug resistance is a bad thing. Um, what causes this? And why are we here? Why is this happening? Why is this happening now as well? Because we, we've had all sorts of advances in medical technology and in medicine and, and in drug discovery. Um, in fact, the first antibiotic was penicillin, discovered in 1928. Since then, we've had more than 100 compounds, uh, but no new class of antibiotic, no new sort of group or strain of antibiotics has been discovered since 1987. Um, so we just haven't had new drugs coming through, and there's a lot of reasons for that. As of March, there are 37 antibiotics in development, going through phases one to three clinical trials, um, but only 11 of those are going to treat gram-negative bacteria, the ones that are really tough to treat. Um, and that's compared to around 800 cancer drugs going through drug development. So we really have a very small number of clinical trials, we have a small number of new drugs coming through, and that does mean that we, we are struggling to treat the infections that we have, and we are at risk um, of treating when we get more infections. Uh, so infection control is a big part of this too. Um, you might remember in 2008, then the government had a big drive on tackling MRSA through a deep clean in UK hospitals across the world. Um, it's easier for bugs to spread in hospitals that are dirty. Uh, it's easier for bugs to spread if you don't wash your hands. So the one thing you take from this is always bloody wash your hands. Please do. Uh, it's really important to stop the spread of, of drug resistant disease. Um, there's also questions that we're still exploring about the link between uh, agriculture and human health. So we know that antibiotics <coughs> are used in enormous quantities, particularly not so much here, but a lot in China, a lot in the US, and other countries in agriculture. And they're used sometimes to promote growth of, of animals to, to make sure animals get bigger. Um, and that can't, that's not a good thing. It does spread antibiotic resistance among animals. We haven't quite yet figured out the link between human and animals. We need to do more work to explore it, but it's definitely a risk. We also know that there's a lot of uh, resistant antibiotics being washed into waste out of the drug development uh, process. It's a, it's a big risk. Um, so I think that I would take away from this, you know, we don't use existing drugs as well as we could do. We're often prescribing antibiotics just in case. Um, we do, uh, the, we need more drugs. We don't have the drugs we need. Um, we could do infection control better, particularly globally in other countries, particularly in the developing world. Um, and there are definite risks from, from agriculture and from waste. <laughs> ah, this has turned out very well. So, I wouldn't worry about the numbers in this. The bottom line here is this is, this is a class of um, Carpenaeum uh, drugs, which other people will correct me on. Um, the main thing is there is one drug here that is, that is uh, effective across the various bugs that we've got at the top, and that's Callistin. Um, all these other drugs, to varying degrees, uh, bugs have required, acquired resistance to. Um, so the fact that we are getting down to that, that magical <coughs> line is very worrying. Um, it means that uh, we see now actually in the US there's been a couple of cases, there's been a couple of reports about resistance to colistin too. So I don't want to be too alarmist, but this is not a good table. Um, and similarly, just to show you what this means in terms of the UK, uh, again, don't worry too much about the numbers, worry about the trend. In pneumonia and coli, you've got uh, rising drug resistance in recent years. Um, as, you know, as I've tried to explain, that resistance grows as uh, often as antibiotics are only used. Um, and then, just to complete the picture, this is what it looks like across Europe. And you know, bottom line is look at the colours, look at the red, uh, look at the oranges, look at the yellows. We have a rising resistance problem across Europe, and this is, this is about the developed world. You know, this, is, this is happening here and now in countries that have money and in countries that have uh, you know, functioning health systems. So this is, this is sort of the scale of problem we're looking at. Jim has already mentioned, moving on to what this means, um, the big figure he came up with, which actually I was quite surprised to see, since he, he said you know, it's 10 million deaths that we risk in 2050, it's a bigger problem in 2050 as perhaps climate change might be, and certainly terrorism. Um, it is up there in the global threats. It's part of the UK government's risk register now about the security risks that they were about. Um, I was a bit surprised. Jim, Jim put this up as a number, and it's a well-evidenced number, and it's got good backing behind it. But so often, when you make these numbers about what's the world going to be like in 2050, you then see 50 other people knocking it down and going, hang on a minute, Jim, it's not 10 million, it's not 10 million, it's 3 million, it's 1 million, you're totally wrong. Actually, what has happened since Jim published that number was experts around the world have, have gone, actually, no, this looks about right. Some have said it could be a bit more. Some have said, actually, if you look at the infection control problems, this could be even greater, this could be by magnitude greater. 
And only last month, the World Bank came out with their own paper that effectively confirms uh, Jim's diagnosis and Jim, Jim's analysis that we do risk going right up there um, in, in coming years. We're currently at around 700,000 deaths a year from, from AMR. And I think one thing that we might come back to is also how you measure it and how you get that surveillance there so that we know, firstly, what, what drugs, what, what drugs and what bacteria are out there, what's happening to resistance, that we can track deaths caused by um, microbial resistance by, by superbugs, which we're not very good at doing at the minute. So at the minute, I'm actually more shaky about that 700,000 number than I am about that 10 million number. Um, and I think that's something that we could work on, that I know that the charity's been looking at, that we have a welcome trust to funding as well. So it's you know, I think a really big deal. So I talked a little bit about what this means in the developed world. But actually, this is an even bigger problem in the developing world. And there's uh, sort of two, two points to say about that. Firstly, uh, you'll see actually in, in Africa, about 4 million, uh, 150,000, and in Asia, about 4 million, 730,000, but those total, about total 10 million. So they are, this is where this, this is going to really hit. And the contributing factors are, firstly, access to antibiotics. So more people in the developing world currently die because they can't get a hold of antibiotics than they do because there's the resistant strains. Access is a really big issue in the developing world and will remain so. So we need to think about increasing access but doing it in a responsible way. So we have stewardship over antibiotics that are only used when they're absolutely necessary. The other point is that you have health systems that are less resilient there than they might be here. And you have different ways of health being delivered. So in India, for instance, it's totally different to the NHS. There's an enormous number of private practitioners. The pharmacies have a huge role there. It's just completely different. Um, and I think where there is less resilience, uh, that's and less ways to pick up where those drug, where that drug resistance may be happening and to do something about it, to isolate patients who are carrying drug resistant bacteria, um, then that is, you know, there's a big risk. And so there are also problems with population density and the way that drugs, the way that bacteria can move around the population. To give you an example, just down the road in the Human 2 Centre at the minute, uh, the Gates Foundation, run by Bill Gates, are hosting their massive jamboree with all their charities, foundations, and researchers. And AMR is one of their themes this year. This year. Um, and at the talk I was at just before lunch, there's an Indian doctor there talking about the problems he faces with multi drug resistant TB. This is TB for which we basically don't have treatments for. And he mentioned uh, Dharavi in India, which is where Slumdog, Slumdog Millionaire was, was filmed in this world set. Uh, and he said, look, in Dharavi, you've got the population of Wales in a space the size of Hyde Park. When you have TB and highly infectious TB in those environments, it is going to shoot through the population where you don't have infection control in a way that we, it's just not the same here. I mean, we have actually rising TB in some parts of the UK, but it's just not the same uh, uh, sort of environment here. And it's important to remember some of the challenges involved in dealing with AMR in the developing world might be about making health systems stronger, as well as getting new drugs, as well as getting new diagnostics, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so it's quite a big, I think context really matters, the country specific stuff really matters. Jim's already mentioned his, his $100 trillion figure. Uh, now this is a figure that I find a little bit uh, less meaningful, say, than the, the, the figure on, on the number of deaths, because it's just so massive. Um, but I think as an economist, it's, it's important to say this does matter in terms of pound and pence. And this is a really important part of what we successfully did in the NEO review, which is to bring it to the table of the world's economists, of the world's finance ministers, of the people who frankly hold purse strings around the global health table. And that's been quite successful. We need to do more of it. Uh, but those graphs like that do actually show, you know, they're credible, the World Bank stood behind them. They show that this has a real economic cost. <coughs> so Jim has talked a little bit about his recommendations. And so the writing is a little bit small, so I do apologize. Um, I'm sure we can send the slides around after if, if you'd be interested. Um, I'd highlight just a few areas. I've talked a bit about new drugs. And with new drugs, it's about more clinical trials. It's about more research. But it's also about changing the way that we pay for those drugs. At the minute, there's a market failure of antibiotics, which you may have heard about in the past. It's not the same as other drugs. We want to use less antibiotics in the future, not more. So if you're a drug company and you've got a choice between investing in antibiotics or investing in vaccines, where we really want to get vaccines out to the, to the world because they really do help enormously, your profit is in vaccines, not, not in antibiotics. So we have to find different ways to incentivize <coughs> drug companies to, to invest in antibiotic research. Um, Jim talked about this thing called the market reward, where effectively you say to drug companies, we'll give you an upfront payment in return for developing antibiotics that is greater than you get, say, vaccines or paracetamol or other, other drugs. 
Um, and attacking that market failure with new drugs is absolutely critical and it's really hard. It also might involve taxing drugs companies or taxing people, taxing people who take antibiotics or, or all sorts of other ways of financing it. But it's one problem that we haven't cracked, that Jim made really good progress on, but we need to do more on. Um, I also raise vaccines on here because the best way you can prevent infections from taking root is to stop them happening in the first place. And spreading the use of vaccines, spreading vaccines where they can help prevent disease in the first place, is a really cost-effective way of dealing with AMR. Um, and I think we need to take that seriously as we look ahead. We also raise rapid diagnostics. Um, so the best thing we could do, the best thing we could ever have, is a test that says, with near certainty, in about 20 or 30 seconds, that's a virus, that's a bacterial infection, or that's a bacterial infection, that's a drug-resistant bacterial infection. We're not there yet. The, we have, there are some good diagnostic tools out there, um, they don't enable us to tell with enough precision um, what is actually happening and where we might need to use antibiotics and where we don't. And to defend GPs and physicians, um, that's why you end up doing antibiotics sometimes as a just-in-case solution. Because you're not sure what the patient has, and so you end up giving antibiotics because that will probably, hopefully, solve some of the problem. But that, in turn, will raise resistance. So I think the diagnostics side of things is a really important area that we have to fix as well. Um, I would also mention agriculture, so I've mentioned it already. What Jim has, has uh, recommended is that we have 10-year targets to reduce unnecessary antibiotic use in agriculture, which is a big deal again, for the agriculture sector, um, introduced in 2018, and also a restriction on certain types of antibiotics. And for farmers uh, across the world, where margins are incredibly tight, um, this is going to be a really tough pathway to delivery. This is going to be a really difficult thing to do. Um, we need to find ways, we're working with the global agricultural bodies, to try and find ways to, to talk about how you could reduce the use of antibiotics in farms and animals. So that's an, another area that's going to take a lot of work, but we're going to have to look at very, very closely. I also mentioned surveillance. And surveillance is a really big challenge, um, but it's one that if we invest in, we will be able to corner drug-resistant strains much more quickly, and we'll be able to know uh, where the new drugs are coming from and how they're being used, and actually clamp down a little bit where we see uh, nations, where we see prescribing practices that aren't helpful. Um, when Jim recommended his, his finished his review and sent it to us in, in government, one of the first questions was, well, you know, how much is it going to cost? Um, and what, does this, what does this mean? And Jim has talked about his 2,250% return on investment, which is, which is almost certainly true um, and a great figure. But I think that 40 million, 40 million um, US dollars is the most important figure. This is not a crazy amount of money across the world. Um, it will take also coordination of research, it will take a lot of joint work, and I'll talk about how we're playing our parts welcome and how the UN is doing their bit and how everyone else is doing their bit. But the main point is that, Jim said, and I think we, we support him in welcome, um, around 2 billion into a global innovation fund, uh, around uh, 16 billion to promote better development of new antimicrobials uh, that might also involve some of those paying pharma companies more upfront so that they invest in R&D more than they are at the minute. Um, and then he also talks about the Global Public Awareness Campaign, which is, a, I think, a critical part of what the charity, can, charity sector and Antarctica UK can do, and can do, can do really well as well, is raising the importance of using antibiotics responsibly and, and almost holding people to account to make sure that then happens. Um, well, I think there is, you know, there's more we can do. <coughs> the good news is that we are making progress globally, um, and that's actually thanks to uh, both leaders like Jim, but also leaders like Dame Sally Davis, uh, our Chief Medical Officer in England, who has been I mean, almost on a non-stop plane ride for the last three years to try and sort of raise us up the global agenda. She succeeded. Uh, we've got the commitment from the G20 to look at some of these market failure questions, and the OECD is going to look at that, which is generally good news, although we're going to have to give them a hand to make sure they're asking the right questions and they're, they're focusing in the right way. The UN General Assembly High Level Meeting, I mean, it sounds very tacky, but actually it's a, really, it's a really big moment because global health has only been discussed three other times at the General Assembly. Um, one where there was the Ebola crisis, one where it was HIV and AIDS, and one where they had a session on non-communicable diseases, so uh, cancer and uh, diabetes and other, other sort of risks that are, are non-infectious. So this means that AMR is really up there as a global risk and people are taking it seriously. And the UN resolution talked about um, getting the right national measures for appropriate use of antibiotics so that every country around the world says, how can I restrict the use of antibiotics? How can I ensure that we're using them responsibly? Also, mobilizing funds for national action plans and for more R&D, for better monitoring and surveillance, and for greater awareness raising. So we felt with the UN, UN resolution and all of the million events around it, we were in good shape. And 
we've got a good impetus from, from global leaders. Um, I'm not going to excuse Pharma and let them off the hook at all here, but I was really pleased to see what Pharma has done as well on both Davos last year and also around the, the UN resolution. But it's actually quite an ambitious industry undertaking to do things like reduce the amount of anti antibiotics in the waste produced by pharma companies. And if we do that, then we, we just have fewer rivers that are contaminated by resistant bacteria. That's got to be a good thing. Um, they've also uh, endeavoured to put more into R&D and to work together more closely with governments and, and, and as a sector. And I think that's also very encouraging. Um, it's not there yet. We need to work to implement all these things. But I think actually, I've been was in Washington last week at the World Bank, been with Gates today. Everyone in the global health community is now saying, this is our moment to tackle AMR. So the challenge is, how do we turn these into these national plans that say, in a way that's relevant in India, it's relevant in this sector where so much is done through pharmacies, and so much is done through non-qualified sometimes physicians. How can we get them to care about stewardship, and how can we get them to use antibiotics better? Um, which is a very different challenge to what we have in the UK, which is we have a GP system that's it's very good, it's a very clear delivery system. How can we get GPs to, to do this in the right way? How can we work with dentists and work with other people using antibiotics to make sure we're reducing use? Um, making things relevant at the national level is how we're going to fix this problem. I'm pleased that we made a bit of progress, but there's a lot to play for still. Um, the one challenge, it gives me a headache, uh, and the Wellcome Trust, is that we have a bewildering number of people working on this. Um, so I don't even know who all of these, these people are. I, I will do it at some point, I promise. But, um, the ones that we care about, Carmex, is a, is a joint um, initiative between us and Boston University uh, and the US, one of the US agencies to create new antibiotics. We've got others who are looking at using antibiotics more effectively. Um, we've got Antibiotics here as well, and there are other charities doing it. One of the big challenges we have as a global community is to coordinate all this work and say, well, what does it add up to? Uh, how, do we get, how do we get on top of this? Um, and that's something that we're going to try and do a bit more of from the this direction. As I say, the good news also is that we've got a good track record in the UK, particularly in England. Um, we were up there with drug discovery, Fleming discovered penicillin here. Um, we've got a continued commitment in the UK to, to, to R&D by the farming industry, and that's, again, it's encouraging, it's a good thing. Um, I talked about the MRSA deep clean in 2008. We, we do things from time to time that really step ourselves up in infection control, and you know, that's a disputed example. There are many others that you know, make sure infection control is as good as it can be. Um, we reduced last year by 8% the, the volume of antibiotics prescribed by GPs. And that's a huge achievement um, given the demands from patients, uh, given the, the temptations to use antibiotics as a just in case form of medicine. And one of the ways we did it actually is Dame Sally Davis just calling up GPs and calling up individual surgeries where she'd seen that they were going through the zillions of, of antibiotics and saying, What on earth are you doing? Have you really got an outbreak of? 30 different sorts of antibiotic infections here, or are you using it as a just-in-case tool? Um, and actually, that very direct route was, was pretty successful. Um, the government now has also pledged to uh, reduce um, by 50% in inappropriate prescribing, um, and also to reduce uh, rate of MRSA in hospitals as well. So I think there's some strong uh, recommendations by the government. Um, again, a lot still to do, but actually we have been a global leader here, and we should be proud of that. Um, personally, you know, my former job, I worked quite close with David Cameron, who, as he went around, almost literally every world leader, he'd go, do you know what AMR is? Oh, no, you don't. What a surprise. This is what it is. This is what we're working on. This is how we can work together. And it was, it was successful in getting it, up, getting it up the agenda and getting it onto the agenda, alongside many other countries. The challenge is now to deliver, um, and that's what we have to do, uh, what we have to do next. Um, on O'Neill specifically, I mentioned the reducing ground negative blood, blood stream infections by 2020, reducing inappropriate prescribing. Um, the Fleming Fund, that's run by the Department of Health, is putting a few hundred million into surveillance overseas, which is absolutely vital to understand where resistance actually is. Um, the UK has also set some targets for lower levels of antibiotic use in agriculture. Um, so they, we're, as I say, we're in a reasonable place. We want to see all these things in the and that's the next challenge. Two seconds on what we're doing as welcome. So since 2004, we funded around 287 million of basic research into antimicrobial resistance and into new drugs. Um, we, we are involved in this Carbex initiative to develop new drugs and develop new antibiotics, and we want to see three or four, four or five new antibiotics come through that in the next 10 years or so. Um, we also want to help with stewardship, we want to help with global coordination, and we're discussing with some of the UN bodies and the WHO what we can do. Uh, so I think for us it's a, you know, it's a really top of mind problem and a really big thing that we want to help with. 
Finally, two seconds on what the third sector can offer here. And I think there is a vital unclosed space. The third sector, including APRA, can help and be active in research. I think that's a really important role. But I think the biggest role, actually, is running patient voices, keeping this issue in the spotlight. And that's why I need to get off the stage pretty soon so I can hand over to people who have real experiences to share with you. Um, that is absolutely vital for showing this is a real problem. As I say, it's something that we didn't have uh, when there was, well, we, do, we did have it when there was the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, there were patient groups who would almost literally beat down the door at global meetings and go, why aren't you listening to us? Why aren't you going faster? Why aren't you producing the drugs that we need? Um, it's great to see patient voices here, but we need more. I mean, it to be much, much more sort of upfront and much more aware. Um, I think also uh, NGOs, particularly working in development areas, we need to mainstream AMR as a challenge uh, that they need to deal with when they think about how they're supporting developing countries to improve their health systems. So you need to say, what can developing countries do, but how can we support them to be more resilient and, and tackle some of the challenges of, of superbugs with AMR?